I'm back again. I'm Alan Gobanek, and we're continuing our videos of backyard birds. And now we're going to look at other possible species that you could perhaps see in your yard. This isn't all that you could possibly see, of course. It all depends, of course, on what you have in your yard, the habitat surrounding your yard. That'll determine what kinds of birds can show up. And what I'm basing these other possible species on is birds that I have seen in my yard over the years. And you may or may not get some of these. You probably will get some other birds that I never get. I think I mentioned in one of the uh, videos that I never get um, pinyon jays in my yard, and maybe some of you do. So at any rate, based upon what I've seen over 17 years here living in Hidden Valley, these are some other possible species that could or could not show up in your yard. So again, if you want to stop the video and write these birds down, go ahead. Or if you want to take a picture of it on your screen, that's fine. Or just wait until we go through and write the names down as we go. So here we go. First bird on the list is the cedar waxwing. These guys are primarily winter residents. In the spring, they start going north and they breed up in the far northern states and up into Canada and so on. They get the name waxwing from the fact that some of them, not all, have these waxy tips on the wings. Uh, beautifully colored bird. The chrism underneath is white. Um, they have a crest, which they can lower as they did, or they can raise it. They've got this what we call a black mask. And this, uh, oh, I don't know what kind of color you call this. I'm sure you girls would have a name for it that I, I'm just calling it a kind of a light brown color. Um, I know I'm wrong with the color, you gals can correct me. Yellowish down here. And they have yellow at the tips of the tail. See that? That's a square cut tail with yellow on the tip. Notice the yellowish, orangish, brownish coloration on the underside. And there's the black mask. It's a tiny beak that they've got. Um, they'll eat insects, but they're also fruit eaters. Monomorphic, can't tell male from female. Uh, in the wintertime, when they come back into town, uh, often see them on my uh, junipers. They like to eat juniper berries. <laughs> and it's fun to see poor robins that are eating juniper berries trying to keep these a whole flock of, uh, of uh, cedar waxwings away from them. And it's uh, just no use to poor robin gets uh, run off. So seven and a quarter inches, so they're smaller than a robin. I'll get them in my juniper berries and I'll often get them coming to my bird bath to drink and to bait. Notice waxy tips on the wings of this one. This guy doesn't have it. No waxy tips on these guys. They've got the yellow tips on the tail, but why some birds have the waxy tips and others do not, I have not been able to find out the reason for that. If anybody ever finds out, please let me know. Here's a closer look. These two have got the waxy tips. The mask, a very, very handsome bird. My, one of my wife's favorite birds, boy. Whenever we got cedar waxwings in the yard, I yell, hey, hey, hun, they're here. And she runs to the window and looks at them. She loves these birds. Another summer breeder here that sometimes passes through my yard in migration on the way up to their breeding areas up in the higher mountains is the western tanager. They're strongly dimorphic. This is the male. Easily recognizable by the bright overall yellow color contrasting with the black and the reddish head. So in the breeding season, the male's got this red all over the head and onto the chin and throat. Loses that during the uh, non-breeding season, but in the breeding season, it's just very easy to recognize this bird. Bright yellow, yellow contrasting with uh, the red on the head and throat, black and white on the wings and so on. So very easy to recognize. I've only seen them come to my bird bath to drink in the spring, and that's it. This is the female, much duller. This is true of all tanagers. The females are much duller in color than the males, but she's got this uh, kind of triangular tanager bill, and then this greenish on the back and kind of yellowish underneath. Female, western tanager. Another bird that usually migrates through my yard, uh, sometime in the spring, sometimes in the fall, and it's a summer breeder up in the um, undergrowth, up in the mountains in the, uh, in the forest, is the hermit thrush. Hermit thrush is in the same family as robins, robins are thrushes, uh, but they're a little bit smaller, six and three quarter inches instead of 10 inches, and they tend to have this brownish coloration. They've got this pale eye ring, buff colored eye ring that goes around the eye. 
and the beak is smaller than that of a robin, maybe even bicolored. But when you see a hermit thrush, you get this rufous coloration in the wings and in the tail. So you see this smaller than a robin brownish bird with streaks on the undersides, but the wings have this kind of reddish brownish rufous coloration to them and you also see it in the tail. That keys you off to a hermit thrush. There's another one very similar to it called the Swainston's thrush, but I'm not going to uh, cover that one here. If you see the front of the hermit thrush, look at all these spots, spotted all over. But take a look, the spots are triangles, not round spots, they're triangular spots. So that, that helps you also recognize it as a hermit thrush. So spotted on the underside, notice all along the flanks too. The rufous in the wings and tail, rufous in the wings and tail, buff colored eye ring. You've got yourself a hermit thrush. Sometimes I see them throughout the winter. I think sometimes some of these guys will hang around in my yard or at least my neighbor's yard throughout the winter and they show up from time to time in my, uh, in my bird bath. But generally they're migrating through uh, to and from their breeding uh, grounds in spring and fall. If you live anywhere near a bunch of rocky crevices or rocky hillsides, you're liable to get this wren, the rock wren, appropriately named because it builds its nest in little crevices in uh, rock outcrops. Uh, they've got a wide variety of different calls, but notice how nondescript it is. Uh, you might remember how nondescript the uh, house wren was. Well, this one's a little bit bigger than the house wren, but it seems to be just about as nondescript. There's barring on the Undertail coverage there. Uh, it does have some barring in the wings, but they seem faint. And I always tend to think of it, it looks like it's got more white spots than bars on it. But it is barred. You can see more bars there. Kind of a uh, uh, relatively long D curve bill, like, like all the wrens have. Monomorphic, just like all wrens. And there it is compared to the Buick's wren. Buick's wren so much easier to recognize. You see again that bold white eyebrow. Uh, bold bands on the tail and the wings and so on. Very easy to see, kind of a dark chocolate color. Whereas a rock wren just seems sort of blah, I guess, bland. All right. Just a LBJ, little brown jobby. Okay. Up in the mountain meadows, you can get this bird called the chipping sparrow. And uh, come spring, I'll sometimes see them migrating through my yard, stopping at the hopper feeder or stopping at the bird bath. Um, this is the only sparrow with a uh, rufous cap. We refer to this guy as the chippy, the chipping sparrow or chippy. Notice, all clear underneath, no markings at all. But on the head, you've got the rufous cap. You have a whitish supercilium or eyebrow, and then a black eye line, characteristic of the chipping sparrow. The upper back has got these brown and black stripes, and then the rest of the back is all grayish, a brownish tail, and brownish wings. A summer breeder, mostly up in the pine forest. Um, as they come through into my yard, you see them out on the grass, ground feeding, or coming to a hopper feeder, or sitting in a bush somewhere. That rufous cap gives it off. There's just no other sparrow that has that characteristic. In the fall, when the young come by, they don't have a rufous cap. Again, having to learn what the young look like compared to the adults. The chipping sparrow juveniles have got these brown and black streaks on the head with kind of a pale median stripe like that, a black eye line, and streaking on the underside. Remember, the adult doesn't have any streaking. It's clear on the undersides, remember? But the young birds, They've got streaking. And I know a lot of people that have seen these birds and have no idea what they are. So you have to learn to recognize the immature chipping sparrow. And in fact, that's true of just about all the sparrows. Many of the uh, juvenile sparrows do not look exactly like the adults. And so you have to learn to recognize them as well as the adults. So, okay. Moving on, another sparrow that can show up, particularly if you've got anywhere near wetlands. These guys like to be in wet habitats along streams and marshes and so on. This is the song sparrow, named for the fact that they've got a really, really, really pretty song. Characteristic, 
for them has got all sparrows have a conical beak. They've got this brown streaking on the head, sort of a grayish supercilium, uh, this brownish eye line, and then grayish along in the face extending back here. And then they've got these two what we call malar stripes. Remember malar stripes that I call the mustache on the uh, on the northern flicker. So these two are called malar stripes, bordered by white. And then they've got a breast that's got streaks on it, some of which extend down to the sides. But on the song sparrow, those streaks extend into and coalesce into what we call a central spot or stick pin. Okay, a central spot or stick pin. The rest of the belly is clear, so it's just streaks on the breast with a central stick pin or central spot. There's another one there. I have some friends down in Genoa who have one coming to their backyard and onto their deck every winter, feeding on some of the seed that they put out there. But that characteristic grayish brown, grayish malar stripes, breast with streaks and a central stick, uh, stick pin, contrasting with clear undersides, that tells you song sparrow. Now there's a wide variety of uh, sizes in song sparrow population, they look from four and three quarter to six and three quarter. And for years, um, biologists have been talking about separating that into several different species, which <laughs> luckily they haven't done yet. But there's a number of different color variations in the population. Notice how this one tends to look more brownish on the face. This one tends to look more grayish, even on the body. This would be a grayish morph. This would be more of a brownish morph. But recognize that central stick pin and, and the breast streaks and the streaks on the face and the malar stripes, no matter what color, you've got a song sparrow. This one is the savannah sparrow, uh, a little streaky LBJ, a little brown jobby, streaky on the back, streaky underneath. But the key is this area between the eye and the beak, that's called the lure. And in the savannah sparrow, they have yellow lures. And sometimes the yellow extends back as a partial, or even in some populations, a complete yellow uh, supercilium or eyebrow. So you recognize them by the yellow lure. And in some populations, that yellow can be very, very faint. In others, it's very bright. It depends upon their, uh, where they are geographically. In the front, they have, just like the song sparrow, they've got streaks on the breast, but the belly is clear. Sometimes some of those streaks could coalesce into a central spot or stick pin, but more often than not, there is no stick pin. But be aware there could be. And then there's the yellow, you know, from the front view, there's a yellow lure, and there's one on the other side. And notice the streaking on the head, kind of a light median line, okay, light median line, and then some darker lines laterally, lateral meaning to the side. Um, white throat and chin with some malar stripes there bordered by black. Okay. So that's the savannah sparrow. I used to see these a lot um, down in the Damani wetlands area and sometimes in university farms. Um, there's a hawk called the prairie falcon that loves to prey on savannah sparrows and these guys will be in short grass areas. Uh, um, the hawk will come flying over and, and scare them up and then boom he goes after one of them. The savannah sparrow. They're summer breeders and I, I think they're also probably residents, because I tend to see them sometime in the winter too. This is a uh, unusual sparrow that, I'm always excited when this one comes into my yard. It's a summer breeder up in the mountains, mountain meadows, and it's called the Lincoln Sparrow. And it's got this beautiful coloration, five and three quarter inches. Notice the brown and black streaking on the head, grayish uh, supercilium, dark eye line, grayish down here. Uh, I don't know what you would call light tan color, I guess, here. These beautiful black spots on the brown background. Uh, almost a rufous coloration in here and in the tail and streaking along the sides. Get a little bit of closer look. You know, this, the characteristic stripes on the head is always characteristic for me. Once I see that, even if I don't see the back of the bird, I know I've got a Lincoln sparrow. It's fine black and brown, fine black or dark brown, I guess, and fine light brown and so on and gray in the middle. Uh, and then the grayish on the face with the brown streak. Um, but what really keys it off as a Lincoln sparrow, if you get to see the front, it's a sparrow with a buffy breast. Buffiness going across the top. There's streaks on the breast, 
may be a central stick pin as you see here, but this buffy color going across the breast will always tell you it's a Lincoln sparrow. And then there you can see the grayish coloration to the head with those brown and black streaks that I talked about. So grayish up here, streaks here, central stick pin, and buffy breast. Okay. That will always tell you Lincoln sparrow. I get them coming through in migration, coming to my bird bath, usually in the spring and sometimes in the fall. Now, this one is always a surprise. This is called the white throated sparrow. It's in, well, I call it an Eastern vagrant, maybe a Midwestern vagrant. It's called the white throated sparrow because obviously the white throat bordered by black lines. And then it's got yellow lures, just like that Savannah sparrow that I told you about. But then a white supercilium, a black eye line, and then two lateral black stripes on the head. Whoops, sorry and a white median stripe. This thing, I'll show you in a minute, reminds you of a white crown sparrow. But notice where it normally occurs. It breeds way up here in uh, Canada, also part of northeastern states, winters in all these parts of America, can migrate through here, but it doesn't occur out in the west. So this is what we call a vagrant. A vagrant bird is one that occurs where it normally doesn't supposed to occur. But you can see these blue lines that indicate sometimes it may end up wintering over here. Over the last several years, I think at least once a year, I'll get someone telling me they've got a white-throated sparrow in their yard. And I've only seen one, I think, three times in my yard over the 17 years. So it's, a, it's an unusual bird for our area. So if you ever see one, Rejoice, this is a neat bird to see. Notice how, looking at the body here, it looks like a white crown sparrow. And in fact, I spotted this bird because I was looking at a bunch of white crowns in my yard. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, something looks, something looks different there. And I spotted the yellow lures. And when it turned, I spotted the white throat. So this can look like a white crown sparrow, but it's called a white throated sparrow. See, here it is compared to the white crown sparrow. White throat, black lines, and yellow lures given away, despite the black and white stripes and the rest of the body that makes it look like a white crowned sparrow. White throated sparrow. If you're anywhere near some bushy hillsides and so on, you're liable to get this small bird, only four and a half inches. This is a resident bird here all year round. This is called a bush tit. Notice how tiny the beak is. Long tail. That's uh, basically almost as long as the body itself with that tiny little beak. Um, it's called a bush tit because you often see them in flocks in the non breeding season, and you'll hear this tit 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 sound before you see them. And then some of them will start flowing out of the bush, and the others come flowing out behind it, and you get this trailing series of, of birds that come out kind of like a long extended flock. And it's that tit 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 sound that gives them away. They look monomorphic, but if you look carefully, you can tell male from female. Males have black eyes, females have yellow eyes. Only way to tell them apart. Here are two that came to my suet feeder in my yard one year. Male or female? Yellow eye, yellow eye, they're both females. This is the kind of nest they build. You know, I always remarked how amazed I was to see the, the nest of a Bullock's Oreo. Well, look at this nest from this tiny four and a half inch bird that hangs all the way down here like a sack with a hole at the top. It's just amazing that they can build something like that. That's the bush tit nest. So if you've got a habitat that has bush tits in it and you have suet in your yard, a suet feeder, you can attract bush tits. This is a bird that often confuses beginning birders because they look at it. And I remember the first time I saw one, you look at it and say, what kind of a sparrow is that? Because it kind of looks like a sparrow. It's a LBJ, a little brown jobby. It's got all these brown streaks on the upper sides, the undersides. Uh, what the heck is it? Well, this is called a pine siskin, five inches. So it's about the size of sparrows. And yes, it does have all this brown streakiness like a, like a sparrow does, but you might be able to see a hint of yellow there and there. Not all birds will show that. 
But at any rate, if you don't even see the yellow, check the beak. What kind of beak do sparrows have? Beaks on sparrows are cone-shaped, conical beak. Here's a song sparrow beak. Here's a golden crown sparrow beak. Look at the beak on the siskin. It's a tinier beak and a thinner beak. Tinier and, tinier and thinner. That helps you to distinguish it from the cone-shaped beaks of sparrows. So pine siskin, can't quite figure out what this sparrow is. Look at the beak. And then if you're lucky, pine siskins, not all individuals, but most individuals have this yellow in the wings and yellow at the base of the tail, which shows best when the bird is flying. But I have had several pine siskins, like probably including that one, on my finch feeder at the same time and could not see any yellow on them at all. I don't know if it's a uh, age-related thing or not. I've not been able to find out. Maybe the young of the year don't have it. I'm not sure. Oops, I'm sorry. I keep hitting long buttons here. So there is the pine siskin. These guys, as the name implies, are up in the pine forest. In fact, often up at the uh, um, tops of the, the mountains, at the tree, uh, tree line and places like that. But they will come down into the valley in the winter time. This, I think, is a very handsome bird. This is the green-tailed towhee, named for the little bit of green that's in the tail. It's a summer breeder here. Uh, they migrate out in the fall come back in the spring, and they can be found in the same locations as your rufous sighted, I'm sorry, not rufous sighted, but what? Spotted toge, in the same area as the spotted toge, the manzanita covered hillsides, brushy covered hillsides, and so on. Uh, I would have called it the green wing toge, but nobody asked me, because there's all this green in the wing, more so than in the tail. Just like the uh, chipping sparrow, it's got this rufous cap. Look at it from the front, you can see this white chin and throat bordered by two black mallard stripes. Some white up here, but there's the, uh, the rufous cap. Other than that, the bird is really all grayish, sort of, with uh, greenish in the wing and greenish in the tail. Seven and a quarter inches, so it's about the same size as the uh, spotted tohi and smaller than a robin. And then I always, I always enjoy seeing this one when it migrates through. This is the varied thrush. This is a male. Females have kind of the same color pattern, but they're much duller. It's bright orange over here, this dark bluish or blackish V, orange in the wings, this dark bluish along the back and onto the tail, orangish on the breast and belly, orange supercilium sticking back like that. This is a migrant that comes through. This is how it looks looking at the back. Uh, relative of the American robin because it is a thrush in the thrush family, nine and a half inches, so almost as big as a robin. They migrate along the coast here. They come through this part of Nevada, and every now and then I'll get one in the spring. Sometimes I'll get one in the fall. Notice, however, they can winter here in these areas over in California and Oregon and Washington. All here all year long, but mostly most of them go up to breed all the way up into Alaska. Very common breeding bird up in Alaska. So that is the varied thrush. I think it's one of the most handsome birds. I just love looking at that one. And we have a couple of taxidermy mounts up at the Galena Creek uh, Visitor Center if you ever get a chance to go up there and take a look at it. Varied thrush. If you've got trees in your yard, particularly uh, fairly high trees, you might get this little guy, four and three quarter inches. The Wilson's Warbler. It's a summer breeder, and occasionally I'll get one coming through my yard in the spring. Bright yellowish bird. Look at that black beady eye that sticks out against the yellow. This guy came in to visit one of my bird baths in my backyard, and the males have got this dark black cap on the head. Females can have some black too, but not as much as the male does. But look at how those black beady eyes stick out against the that yellowish face. Tiny beak, yellowish extending all the way down the undersides. The back is mostly kind of olive greenish, as you can see, and the tail has some greenish in it, but tends, to, tends towards grayish. The wings sort of grayish with a little bit of greenish in them. There's a better look at the back, okay? The black cap, the black beady eye surrounded by yellow. This Olive, I guess it's olive greenish, let's call it a greenish back extending all the way down. Some of it on the scapulars and so on, contrasting with yellow. Four and three quarter inches, a tiny Wilson's Warbler. 
usually found in wet habitats along streams and in willows and so on. And then this is one, I've only seen this in my yard once and I never ever expected to see a bird like this. This is a bird of uh, wetlands and streams and waterways and so on. It's called the yellow breasted jack. It's a warbler, actually one of the largest of our warblers, seven and a half inches. And it is a summer breeder. It's got this broken eye ring, thick beak for a warbler on this white streak here. Notice all the yellow on the breast, hence the name yellow breasted chat extending onto the sides. This guy was in the bushes and then actually came out and walked along in my driveway with an insect in its beak and gave me a great look at it. Thank you very much. So broken white eye ring, white extending from the uh, eye to the uh, base of the beak. Sometimes when you've got a white line like this or any kind of line, it extends from here back to the eye with an uh, eye ring or partial eye ring. They sometimes refer to that as spectacles because it looks like the bird is wearing uh, spectacles or eyeglasses. White slash there, brownish along the wings and back, but that bright yellow on the breast gives it away. The yellow breasted chat plus its size, seven and a half inches. Now these guys are an uncommon resin. I know there are some in Reno. I've been told they're around all year round, but you hardly ever see them. I've only seen them in my yard maybe two or three times over the years. You go down to Las Vegas and they're all over the place in Vegas. You go over to Sacramento area, they're all over the place in there. This is the Northern Mockingbird. It's got kind of a grayish coloration to it, clear undersides, long tail, almost as long as the body itself. Um, this kind of a, um, thickish beak that reminds you of a uh, kind of like a robin's beak but it's not in the same family as robin's uh, grayish brownish on the top likes to stick its tail up like that very characteristic posture with the tail stuck up like that so it's kind of bicolored uh, darker on the upper sides lighter on the underside long legs and if you get a good close look at it it's got an orange eye orange iris contrasting with the brownish head clear undersides and then there are like a wing bar and this looks like a wing bar but it's actually a wing patch as I'll show you the bird is 10 inches long so it's as big as a robin and they have this habit of when they land somewhere they open the wings like it's they raise the wings so you can see these white wing patches in them like that here it landed on a table once and those are the under wing covers, but it's got its wings raised up. There's another view of it from the back. When they land on the ground, they'll raise the wings like that. And we think what they're doing is trying to surprise insects and get insects to fly up so they can grab them and eat them. The Northern Mockingbird. It's called the Mockingbird because as some of you may know, this guy can mock or mimic the sounds of a number of different species. I remember once being down at the southern edge of Washoe Lake, <clears throat> there was a northern mockingbird there, and he put on a show singing for about half an hour, and he must have had about eight or ten different bird songs in his repertoire. If I didn't know it was a mockingbird, I'd have thought there were several other species of birds there. Uh, very common characteristic is to sing the songs of lots of different birds, mimic them, excellent mimic. This is the kill deer. Um, this is a shorebird, normally found along mud flats and uh, along the sides of streams and so on, about as big as a robin, 10 and a half inches. It's a resident bird, um, easily recognized as all white underneath, long legs because it's a wading bird, so it can wade in the shallow water. A red eye ring, contrasting black and white bands here. You often see books say two. Uh, two black neck bands. Well, this one looks like it's on the breast to me instead of a neck, but there's two definite black bands there. There's another look at it close up. There's that nice, brilliant eye ring. White on the forehead with a black line above it, brownish crown. And then there's the two white rings contrasting with the two black wings and the completely clear undersides. Monomorphic, can't tell male from female. Uh, they have this rufous in the base of the tail and up onto the, I think, the undertail coverts, which you don't usually see until the bird flies. It has one of those white rings there. When the bird flies, you can see all that rufous there. 
in the tail and upper tail covers. And that white in the wing extends as a nice white band along both the secondaries and the primaries. Very obvious to see. These guys get their name from their call. Kill deer, kill deer, kill deer, kill deer, kill deer, kill deer, kill deer. And they'll make that kiddie, 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 kiddie song as they're flying like this. Now, I see them, um, I don't know how many of you have ever been on the new, relatively new Veterans Parkway. As I drive south on the Veterans Parkway, I'll often see them on the grassy medians there, right through the neighborhoods with all the houses. So I'm um, assuming that these guys could also get into people's backyards. And so that's why I'm including this as a possible bird in your yard. This is the one that's famous for doing the broken wing act. If you get close to its nest, or if a coyote or another predator gets close to the nest, the bird that's sitting on the nest will start feigning a broken wing, and it just kind of flaps the wing and makes a call and keeps dragging itself farther and farther and farther away. The coyote thinks it's got a nice, easy meal, and eventually when the bird gets far enough away from the nest, whoop, off it goes. The coyote stands there just shaking its head, wondering what happened. That's called the broken wing act, and it's really neat to see. And there's lots more birds, but enough for now. I hope uh, you've been able to stand it going through all these videos. I uh, thank you for your patience, and I hope that you have good, happy birding in your backyard. I hope it gets you started on a nice career of birding, not only in your backyard, but other habitats throughout the state and even in other states and other countries. Best wishes to you. If you have any questions about birds, feel free to contact me. Bye for now.